We're sisters, best friends, and authors on a mission to help you stoke your creative fire and live the life of your dreams. We believe that purpose fuels passion and that creativity is your secret weapon for mass construction. There's never been a better time to bless the world with your dream realized. You're listening to The Kate and Abby Show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Kate and Abby Show. We're so stoked to have you here today. We are breaking down some fundamentals in this episode. It's going to be awesome. So have your notebook ready, grab a cup of coffee, do whatever you need to do because this is going to be a power-packed episode. We're going to break down how to write better internal conflict in three simple steps. So if you've been around on mine and Abby's respective channels or watched this podcast for any length of time, you know that Abby and I believe this is the one element that is the most important part of telling a good story and that is internal conflict. Internal conflict is the desire and fear that your character faces within them. It's the driving force that will cause them to change and transform throughout the story. This concept is vital and it can be challenging to implement sometimes. So today we're breaking down how to nail your character's internal conflict in three simple steps. This is gonna be a fun one. But before we dive into it, we first have to thank our sponsors who are you guys. You are the ones who support this show and keep it going and we so appreciate your support. So if you get value out of this podcast, go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show and help us keep this show alive and free of interruptions. So internal conflict, I mean, I know this is something that you don't really know too much about and you don't really talk about it ever. <laughs> like, I mean, it'd be cool if sometime you did a YouTube video where you like touched on it just a little bit. Yeah. Because I feel like you you never talk about it, like, ever. I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, for those Obviously of you... Obviously being sarcastic. For those here. of you who have been around, um, you, you're laughing at that because, you know, Abby talks about internal conflict probably more than anybody. Yeah. Um, because this is a vital, vital, vital aspect of storytelling. This is yes. what's going to... Make us get addicted to a story that's going to keep us reading way past our normal bedtime on the edge of our sheet, seat, waiting to see what happens yes. next in, in film, in, in books, in, in a series, whatever it is. A story is a story is a story. This, this applies for all of it. This is across the board. Yes. Yeah, it really is the most important aspect of storytelling. And this is something that again and again, and I talk about it so much on my channel because of this, Everyone who first encounters this idea of internal conflict is like, wow, yes, that's the missing ingredient. Didn't know what to call it mm, until yeah, yeah, yeah. they hear that term. I feel like a lot of writers are in that boat. Like yeah. they, they, when you explain what it is, they're like, yeah, that thing. And, and just didn't have yes. the name for it. Right. But yeah. they, when you start because breaking it down, they're like, yeah, that's so important. Yeah. It, it, because they don't really teach that a lot of times in traditional writing advice, mm -hmm. you know? I've read so much writing advice and so many writing advice books and a lot of them don't focus hardcore on the internal conflict and that is what makes us care. That is the magic ingredient that makes you empathize with this character as being like you. You know, there's there's something that's relatable about them. It's not um, just their occupation or what they enjoy doing or their personality because those things are different for everybody. So how can we relate to every single character? How can we write a character that any person can relate to? Right. And the answer is internal conflict. Having that clash of desire versus fear, that is what creates this opportunity for us to care about what this person is struggling with right so and i think breaking it down super simple internal conflict is conflict happening internally yes great way to remember it exactly. because all it is is like what is your character dealing with internally so the plot is everything happening outside the character that's the external conflict and then the internal conflict is what they feel about it and how it's impacting them and how they're impacting the external conflict. Yes. Which really, that's a better flow for it, for the internal conflict to influence the external conflict rather than just like you were saying and like you always say, 
the character becoming a punching bag for the plot, meaning all yes. that's happening is external conflict and your character's kind of just like bobbing and weaving the yeah. the plot coming at them. <clears throat> yes. You want it more internal conflict is influencing the external conflict. It's influencing how the story and the plot is playing out around these characters. Right. Yes. And that's why I always say external conflict, the plot is what happens. Internal conflict is why it matters. Mm. So let's break this down into the three easy steps. And this is something that I've talked about on my channel, but it always bears repeating and kind of digging into a bit more, which is what we're going to do here. So step one is finding your character's misbelief. And I like making this step one in my uh, process because it's really at the heart of your story's theme. It's really like, it's kind of like the reverse engineered theme of your story. Like if you can flip your theme of your story on his head, turn it into a lie because it's really a truth, right? It's a truth or a big idea that you want to scream from the rooftops, but you're weaving it into your story. If you turn it upside down and make it a lie, make it the opposite of what it is, that's essentially your character's misbelief. And that's always been the easiest way I find to, to create that misbelief for your character. Yeah. Um, and it's a great way to reflect the theme of your story because your character going on this journey is eventually going to realize that this misbelief is a misbelief and they don't have to believe it. They can accept and embrace a new idea or a new belief as truth. Right. And that kind of all works together with your character's arc to create that satisfying moment of realization, that aha moment. I love that. So you're just inverting it. Yeah. Really is all it is. Yeah. So that That's really, really cool. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people, um, a lot of our listeners and people on uh, your channel ask like, well, how do you find what the misbelief is? Mm -hmm. So how would you answer that? I would say do what I just said about the the theme, finding the theme or the idea that you are passionate about and see how you can reverse it and turn it into mm -hmm. like, what's the opposite of that look like? Yeah. What is a person who believes the opposite of that? What does their life look like? What do their beliefs look like? What are some of the ways that their habits and their lifestyles kind of revolved around this mistaken belief? And maybe it's a belief about themselves or about the world or about others or all three. And maybe they have multiple misbeliefs, but you probably want to focus more on one so that you can kind of focus on the, the theme or the aha moment that they're yeah. going to have later on. Because that's, this is really about an internal journey, like we're saying in the intro, except it's also an external journey too. But one kind of begets the other. In a right, way. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that it's, it's kind of just aligning the plot and what's happening within the character. So if you have, and you can probably think of a, a TV series or a film or a book where there was a lot going on in the plot, but you didn't really care that much about any of the characters and you didn't even know why because there was so much going on, but you were kind of like, eh, I could stop reading this at any moment and not really care about what happens next. That was because the plot and what was happening internally weren't aligned at all. We were just totally focused on yeah. what is happening externally. And yeah, there just wasn't enough internal conflict. Right. I've read so many books like that that I don't finish because it's like... I think that's the main thing that makes someone not finish a book. It, it, you don't care. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, this stuff is happening. So am I going to be um, excited to know what's going to happen? Not really. Mm. I care about who it's happening to. And if I care about them, then I'll be excited to know what's going to happen to them. And the magic behind that is when you care about the character, it doesn't matter what is happening. You could have the most simple premise possible, the most simple premise imaginable, and someone, your reader, will be hooked in really caring about what's going to happen because we care about what's happening to that character, not so much the story itself. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it could be something super, super simple. Like so many of, of our favorite films and books, it's a very um, 
simple, subtle story, not a lot happening, but yet you care so much about the character that it doesn't have to be something big and epic per se. And flip side of the coin, if you're writing like high fantasy, action adventure, sci-fi, it's going to make the intensity just go through the roof to care about the character because we don't care about action so much that's happening to a bunch of characters we don't care about. But when it's happening to characters that we're hooked in and we're waiting to see what's going to happen to these people because that's what we're thinking of them now as people that we can relate to. Right. That's what makes it all the more intense. So no matter what kind of story you're writing, it just is going to take it to that next level. Yeah. And another thing that I think is worth mentioning about the misbelief is looking into your character's past, into their backstory, because that's a great place to develop their misbelief. Because really, it, it happened to some point in the past. Maybe you have a character who is like a teenager. Maybe it's something that happened in their childhood. Or you have an older character. It could be something that happened at any point in their life. But it doesn't necessarily have to be like a tragic childhood backstory. But the reason why that is so popular is because it works. It's a story <clears throat> model that works because a lot of people have events that happen to them in their childhood where they're still in those downloading stages of your youth and you accept things as true that maybe aren't true. You start to adopt your beliefs. Um, and so figuring out where the misbelief came from and then pinpointing that exact moment in the past and even writing that backstory scene can be really helpful. Like we're even, utilizing that a lot in our co-write. Yes. A lot. Yeah, like as sure. you're, ta as you're what, saying this, I'm thinking that I'm like, yeah. it's just oh, so yeah. perfect. And that's what makes it feel so rich. Yeah. And, um, and you know, like you care about these characters, like, mm -hmm. for us anyway, writing it. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. for you guys too when you read it someday. Yes. But, it it just enriches the story so much because it's not a vague concept. It's not just a belief. It hits home. And it it's something that it's people can relate to. It's an emotional to. experience. Yes. You know? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be big either. No. You know no. what I mean? It can be very um, slight. It can be extremely slight and nuanced. And it, there's like, ugh, the possibilities are just endless. Yes. With that. So out of this misbelief, this is at the heart of your character. This is something that they make every decision based on this misbelief. Every choice they make in their daily life, whether it's a big choice, for instance, in response to the inciting incident, if it's their impossible choice moment, or if it's something simple, all of it kind of comes from the same sphere of belief. Okay, and that has to do with their personality as well. Another thing, if you're struggling with misbelief ideas and you're like, I don't know what to write about, like I want something compelling and relatable, but I don't really know what ideas and themes I wanna weave into this story, or you just want some ideas, I would highly recommend going to the Enneagram because the Enneagram system is a great way to pinpoint your character's personality and dig deeper into this idea of the goal, the fear, the beliefs. Because each Enneagram type has different goals, different fears, different beliefs. And it's interesting to kind of learn the patterns of those two conflicting, uh, you know, those two points of conflict. Right. You know, like the, the different types will each have a different belief, a different fear that's generally known to be associated with that personality type. And that can be just a great place to start. Um, and you can kind of branch off from that. You don't have to, certainly don't have to fit your character inside You can use type. it as a springboard yeah, to so start getting springboard. ideas. It's yeah. like, it's like a way to get prompts. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of a prompt for yeah. crafting and stacking these different personality traits within a character. And then if you have two characters or you're writing a relationship yeah. between two characters and then how those, yeah. what conflicts might come up, what arguments might come up, what, what chemistry might be there and, and use that to figure mm. that out too. Yeah. I can see where that would be super helpful. Yes. And like making sure you're staying in character, mm. you know, and not writing something into this character, making them care about something that they just wouldn't care about, you know, right. like say you're writing an Enneagram three. Okay. And you want you're going to kind of weave in this conflict of they they want success, they're afraid of failure. That's generally like the at the core of an Enneagram 3. In the most basic sense of the um, desire and fear. 
Now you could branch off of that and make it more nuanced, but you wouldn't necessarily want the your Enneagram 3 character to then start suddenly having this goal of something very different from their personality, like like an Enneagram 7, <laughs> and say you're writing an Enneagram 7 in the same story, and you wouldn't want the Enneagram 7 to suddenly be obsessed with success because their goal would be different. So these are kind of interesting um, guidelines to use to sort of keep you on the right track, just right. as you're getting started and as you're getting your sense of the, the characters in the story. And, and sometimes it's a good... Um, a good sort of rule to measure other things by as you go along deeper into the story. Right, yeah. I like for the co-write word, mm -hmm. um, writing, Abby and I have gone back and read through, we, we read all the time mm -hmm. with each other, and Abby has been able to pinpoint like, oh, that character is probably this type, and that character is probably this type, and we didn't necessarily like set out with that in mind, but you can, as you read back and go through the editing process, yeah. you can sort of identify um, things that align with that. Yes. And then it helps you through the editing process because that's one of the things you want to really look for is like, um, is this character sounding too much like that character? Or are they just sounding out of character for themselves mm -hmm. and, and staying in alignment with that? Because that's what really makes a character feel so believable is when you keep them on character and don't allow them to, not that they don't have an arc, of course they have an arc, but you don't want them to start sounding like other characters and lose their voice along the way. Yes, because their personality pretty much always stays the mm, same, right? generally. Right, they'll have like, a character arc, but their personality yeah. traits are still going to be there at the base right. of it. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that kind, of, that kind of goes right into our next point, which is step two, finding your character's desire and goal. So these two things kind of go hand in hand. Their desire and their goal are very similar. One probably begets the other, but their desire is probably fear-based. So we established this, we're starting to establish this internal conflict now. They have a misbelief. They have something that happened to them in the past that made them believe this thing is true. And it's something that they're going to realize is not true at some point during their character arc. So the desire is the deeper seated element and the goal comes out of the desire in that you make goals, actionable steps that you can take towards bringing you, bringing you closer towards happiness or contentment, whatever your idea of that is. So this character has an idea of what would make them happy, what would give them ultimate satisfaction and that desire is born out of the misbelief, but their goal to get that happiness is not going to ultimately be the best thing for them. Right. In fact, it's going to pretty much set up the whole plot to be conflict after obstacle after conflict after mm -hmm. obstacle. And that's what makes the character arc interesting is they have this stupid goal, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah. that they're like, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to be good. It's going right. to bring me to ultimate satisfaction. And we can see that their goal is based off of fear. Their goal is based off of a misbelief, which mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the fear next. Mm -hmm. But the goal, I think, is one of the most important things because it gives your story that sense of momentum of like, okay, I see this character. I see where they're coming from. I see what they're struggling with and I see them going after something. Like they're pursuing something. They're an active character. They're not just a punching bag who is just standing around as life knocks into them. Right. You know? <laughs> Which yeah. is so vital. If I start reading a book with a character who doesn't have a goal, it's like, what is this about? <laughs> yeah. That's really what makes you remember a story. Honestly. Yeah, and like even it's, finish it. <laughs> right. It's like, what is happening? What yeah. is happening? And so... To be like, there are so many films that I've watched, also books, but mostly films for me because I, I enjoy that that uh, art form more. Um, where I'll be like, someone will be like, What was it about? And I'm like, I don't even know how to describe what it was about. Like, I literally don't know what it was about because it was so unclear. And that's exactly what you don't want. And the thing that makes it memorable, the thing that when someone asks, What is it about? and you say, It's about this, really, you're describing the goal of the story. Yeah which is the goal of the main characters, right? 
Yes, exactly. And so that's how this all ties back, yeah. is that why do they even have this goal? They have this goal because they believe this thing is mm-hmm. true, right? And they're trying to pursue this thing because they mistakenly believe this will bring them happiness. And so they're pursuing that. Um, and yeah, you're right. That's that's what drives the plot forward. That's what gives the story momentum. And that's that your character should be kind of the, the first domino, you know? Yeah. It sh- they should be taking that first step, which sets off the chain reaction of events that happen in the plot. Now, something can happen to them. Obviously, a lot right. of times the inciting incident is something external happening to the character that they never expected or saw coming, kind of knocking their world off axis. And that is interesting to watch, but only if you have a conflicted character already, right. you know? Yeah, I keep thinking as we're talking about this of Edmund from the first Narnia book yeah. and film is honestly just such a textbook great example of every single thing we're talking about. So if you're like, oh, I wish I could see this play out in a story, like go watch the first Narnia movie and just case study Edmund's character arc, his desire, fear, and misbelief and how that that triggers. Yes. It actually is the inciting incident for mm. the entire story and the character arc for the character of Edmund. Yeah. It's just perfect. It's just a master class in every single one yeah. of these points done so well. Yeah. And that's something Abby and I do all the time. If you want to understand these better in a more hands-on way, watch your favorite stories and identify these points as you go. Or read your favorite books and identify these points as you go. And yeah, just case study. <clears throat> yeah, you can learn a lot from that. I always like to say a story is the best teacher of story because you can learn so much just by analyzing and observing what is it that makes this good okay let's get 10 of your favorite movies and look at them all cross-examine them and see what they have in common because I guarantee you there are patterns there are patterns with the characters with the story structure with the plot and the maybe even the themes you know there are all of these patterns in every good story right these commonalities that make a good story and you can take those commonalities as principles and then use them on your own story which to me is so exciting because it opens up this whole new world really of storytelling you know it allows you to take any idea and make it brilliant Mm. like not have to worry about oh is this idea good enough well if you have these elements those are the magic ingredients. Mm-hmm. So you just need those magic ingredients. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be up to chance or genius or your muse really liking you that day. It can be, exactly. it can be structured and that's okay. Like and can, that's actually like, it, it makes you relax yeah. so much more when you realize, you know, it's not really about you working up a sweat to make this thing magnificent this is about implementing science and structure and things that you don't have to panic you just have to be mindful about having these building blocks that you can just take your story to that next level with yeah yeah and so think about this with your own characters that you're developing what are their desires what are their goals how do those two things relate How is their desire directly attached to their misbelief? So why do they want what they want because they believe what they believe? And you can see this in your own life too if you start to kind of analyze your own um, beliefs and goals and you can see how your own goals in life are connected directly to what you imagine as your perfect idea of happiness, right? What you imagine would bring you perfect contentment in your life. Those are the things that you are pursuing. Those are the goals, the action steps you're taking. So the same goes for your character. Mm. And, you know, hopefully you don't have, like, too much of a fatal flaw, misbelief in your own life that's holding you back. But we all have misbeliefs that hold us back. Yeah, even if they're small, I mean, in your your everyday life. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And and we overcome those. Those are Just by identifying them. You know, that could be, like, a cool... uh, therapeutic practice yeah, in your can. journaling session. I can, for sure. Defining your own misbeliefs and debunking them. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the third point here is finding your character's fear. 
So this is similar to the misbelief, but it's different. And I've had several writers ask me, how is the fear different from the misbelief? The easiest way to think of it is that the fear comes from the misbelief or the misbelief is the root of the fear. So kind of like how the desire is the root of the goal, the misbelief is the root of the fear. So because we have this misbelief, we have this fear. If we didn't have that misbelief, we wouldn't have the fear. But the fear is what is constantly like that little voice whispering in the back of your character's mind, kind of guiding their steps mm -hmm. and forcing them to make fear-based decisions as they try to pursue this goal. So it's something that they want to avoid. It is their worst nightmare. It is the worst possible scenario that could happen to them. And even sketching this out would be a good idea too. Like if your character, like write a journal entry from your character's point of view of like what they're afraid will happen to them. <laughs> like their worst fear, worst nightmare scenario and just see what comes out. Yeah. See what your character's like deepest, have a therapy session with your character basically. This is basically <clears throat> what it is. It's like having a therapy session with your character, sitting them down on a imaginary couch and asking them all of these uncomfortable questions <laughs> like writing down their yeah, answers exactly and i that's worked really well for me i know other writers who have done the same method and it has worked well for them as well and it's it's interesting because it's just a better way to get to know your character mm. on kind of a more personal yeah. level you know and to get them to trust you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. write them. <laughs> it is. It, it feels really like that. It, it does. It is. Because you are kind of stepping into, not kind of, you totally are stepping into their voice. Mm -hmm. You're getting into character. You're becoming that character. You're learning their voice. You're learning their little quirks. You're learning what their wor worst case scenarios are, the things that they are afraid of, the things that they dream about and look forward to. These are all things that are going to make your character feel like a real person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So these are the three fundamentals to making your character conflicted and relatable and these are things that I when I'm when I first start developing a story I just kind of like briefly go through these three points in my mind and then I start to kind of flesh out the characters but this is a great exercise to do for any character really in in a book or a movie like we we're saying earlier you know analyzing your favorite stories analyzing maybe what stories don't capture your attention i guarantee you that it has to do with a lack of internal conflict with the characters yeah um, honestly that's just as important abby and i will constantly talk about okay we watched a film together and we both didn't enjoy it why what was it we yeah. felt was boring what didn't hold our attention why did we not finish reading this book what was it that didn't hold our attention what is it that didn't capture us? That's just as important as case studying stories that you love, stories that you really don't like. What is it that you didn't like about them? Yeah. What is it that didn't hold your attention? Yeah. yeah. Because so there's the same things that you need to um, take into your, your quiver and make sure you don't make those mistakes in your own work. Yeah, exactly. So it can be just as helpful. So all of this... There's so much to talk about, honestly, yes, with building characters and building internal conflict. But all of it is, it's cool because you can, you can kind of just scratch the surface and have a good start or you can take it deeper. And so Kate and I definitely invite you to take it deeper and dig deeper into all of this. And you can do that um, multiple ways, but of course, by watching more episodes of the show and watching my videos on my channel. I also have a live training that I did um, a while ago now, but it's a really good live training about crafting conflicted characters. And in that training, I kind of take these three points, but I also go deeper into all of it um, and show you an ex uh, example character, kind of like real time creating a character's internal conflict, which was really fun to do. Um, and that live training is still available. You can still watch it. We will leave the link below this video if you want to check it out. Um, and I talk about a lot of this in many of my live trainings, but that one specifically is really good, like basics of creating conflicted, relatable characters. If you wanna just dig deeper into 
all of the basics. And when you sign up, you also get access to all of Abby's other live trainings and access to her upcoming live trainings in the future, right? Yes, yeah. So, so you get month. like the whole yeah. stash, all of yes, it. Yes, all the archives. And it's it's really, there's, there's just <laughs> so much. Like you go into crafting villains, crafting, mm. like you go through so many different things. Yes, yeah, there's a training <clears> on crafting villains, crafting side characters characters and subplots, plotting, start to finish. Um, so many live trainings in the archive to check out. And I do need a new one every month. So it's it's a great um, experience. Definitely, definitely check it out. The uh, link is in the description box below this episode, below the video. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to being inside of the Patreon as well. So we hope that you guys took some notes during this episode and hopefully this kind of helped you to start with developing your characters and making them conflicted to write better internal conflict. It's one of mine and Kate's favorite topics. Okay. <laughs> so we could go on forever about can't it. can't shut up about internal but, conflict. Yeah, but we're going to leave it there because there's so much to say about it. And but hopefully it, this is a good springboard yes. for you to start asking your own questions, yeah. explore, and try different things. See what works. See what doesn't. Case study. Just remember the, the basics, finding the misbelief, finding the desire and the goal, and finding the fear. Yes. Yeah. Very simple. Very simple. If, if more writers did this, it, it would create so many better stories. <laughs> yeah, it would. And, and don't overcomplicate it. I think yeah, it really a lot of times we scare ourselves with stuff and we yeah. really don't need to. Like, yeah. just, just make it like really, really simple. And think of like, if I could just write this with reckless abandon and not care how would I write it, and then write it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Like, just don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't overthink it. It doesn't is. need to be complicated. Yes, for sure. I agree. So comment below. Tell us what you guys thought. We'd love to hear from you guys. We would love to hear about your characters as well. What are their internal conflicts, respectively? Maybe their misbeliefs or their desires or fears. If you if you feel compelled to share, we would love to hear about your characters yeah, and your definitely. stories. Thank you guys so much for listening. And thank you for watching the show. If you haven't seen the video version of the podcast. You can check that out on Kate's YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash K-A Emmons. Thank you again to our amazing patrons who make this show possible. We love you guys so much. If you get value out of this podcast, go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show and help us keep it alive and free of interruptions. We will see you guys in the next one. Until then, stay stoked and rock on.